So uh, last class we talked about liquid vapor equilibrium, but with one condensable component, right? That's the case of some volatile liquid, water, ethanol, toluene, benzene, some, something that can evaporate into a gas phase. And I use the word gas specifically because it's a supercritical fluid, which means it cannot <coughs> condense into a liquid. So I cannot just squeeze oxygen and expect it to become a liquid because it's super critical, it's above its critical point. Above its critical point, there's no phase transition from a vapor to a liquid. So today, we're going to transition and take the full form of Routes Law and talk about how it applies to a mixture of two fluids that can be both in the gas phase and in the liquid phase. <laughs> so the full form of Routes Law, well, Routes Law is a, a simplified way to do vapor-liquid equilibrium. It is not particularly accurate. But in order to have a more accurate form, it takes a lot more background and theory. So we're going to focus on how to apply Routes Law for OSTAR problems. But in your next semester's thermodynamics class, the focus will be all, all on non-ideal mixtures. So Routes Law, what it does is it relates between the composition of the liquid, right? X of I is the liquid mole fraction times by the vapor pressure equal to the vapor composition, Y of I, mole fraction in the vapor phase, and the system pressure. So this is the liquid mole fraction. This is the vapor pressure. This is the vapor mole fraction. And this is the total system pressure. Now, you recall that yi times by p, mole fraction times by the system pressure. We can also write this as lowercase pi, which is the partial pressure. Now, this equation, Routes Law, is for every subspecies i. So if I have a three component system, I would have three different versions of Routes Law. And each version would relate, let's say if it's an A, B, C system. I would be relating from the liquid composition of A to the vapor composition of A. I would need another equation to relate between the liquid composition of B and the vapor composition of B. Liquid composition of C, vapor composition of C. Right? So you get a lot more equations that you have to have, all of them balanced simultaneously. So when you're doing a liquid vapor equilibrium problem, you have lots and lots of equations that have to be simultaneously satisfied. Now, as a really quick side note, right, uh, for gas dissolved in liquid, right, I just said that that's not possible, right? But if it's not possible, then all the fish in the world would die, right? There has to be a little bit of oxygen that can dissolve in water, otherwise fish can't breathe. But we don't use the same form of Routes Law. We use something called Henry's Law. Now, the reason why I say that gases really don't dissolve in liquids, for a big bulk perspective, I mean, it's like 0.0001%. It's a very, very small amount of gases that dissolve. So when we're talking about a humidity calculation, like what we're working on for this week's homework, that small amount of how much nitrogen and oxygen and argon dissolve into water is an insignificant amount. Because what we really care about is how much water is evaporating or how much benzene is evaporating. Right? We're mostly going to care about that. But if you do care about fish in your fish tank, then you will care about Henry's Law. So in Henry's Law, we adopt the vapor side as the same as Routes Law, but then instead, we just have some magical coefficient called <coughs> Henry's coefficient. Henry's coefficient. This is strictly an empirical formula, and we only use it to adopt because it looks similar to Routes Law. So instead of using vapor pressure, we use the Henry's Law constant. But the idea here is similar. If I know what the mole fraction of the gas is in the vapor phase, let's say it's air at normal atmospheric conditions, 
right? This is going to be 0.21 oxygen times by the system pressure, 101 kilopascals. We can use the Henry's law constant to tell us how much of that oxygen actually dissolves. And it's a very low mole fraction. You know, times 10 to the minus 5, times 10 to the minus 6. It's not a ton. Yeah. So x is the mole fraction of species A dissolved in the liquid. Correct. Yep. <clears throat> Is that yeah. the fraction of that species to all of that species, or of that species to all of the liquid? All of the liquids. Okay. So in the case of Xi, Xi is equal to the number of moles of species I in the liquid phase divided by the total number of liquid molecules. Same thing for the Y, but for gas. Right? So it's not the total composition. And this is a good point. So the notation that we will use for total notation is Z of I equals total mole fraction. And if you look at your diagram that we'll talk about in a moment, you'll see that I have Z of methanol and Z of isopropanol. That's the total composition. And so we'll be spending most of our time uh, trying to figure out how we actually look at these XY diagrams and so on. Uh, <clears throat> so the reason why liquid vapor equilibrium is so important Oops, that's loud. is because of a flash separator and distillation column. These are going to be two of the most common separation processes in a chemical plant. Right? We typically deal with fluid handling as chemical engineers. Now that could be Vapors, or gases as a fluid, or liquids as a fluid. Yes? Sorry, you said Z, so that is liquid and gas? That's total. Right, so that's all of the moles of species I as a liquid plus all of the moles of species I as a vapor divided by the total number of moles in the system. So it's the total composition. So let's say you condensed it all to a liquid, in which case Xi would equal Zi. Let's say you vaporized it all to a, to a gas, Yi would equal Zi. That's the total composition you're feeding to the system. Question back there. Okay. So, now this will help clarify things when we talk about a flash separator. So a flash separator we have a feed to the system. Now this feed is typically going to be a liquid, but it doesn't have to be. Right? Typically, liquids are just easier to transport. So if you can move a liquid, you'd like to. So this is generally going to be a liquid, but not always the case. Right? And so in this case, x of i of the feed, the mole fraction of species i in the feed, is going to be equal to the total composition of i, z of i. That, that, that notation make sense? Now, this is going to be the top stream. This is going to be the bottom stream. Top stream is going to be which phase? Gas, right? Gas is flowing to the top. So in this case here, we're going to have some molar flow rate of the top, and it's going to have a composition of all of the different Y of I's, the mole fraction of species I in the vapor phase. The bottom is going to have some total flow rate of the bottom stream, and some liquid composition. <clears throat> now this is a separator. Our goal is to separate some components to the top stream and some components to the bottom stream. So in order for this process to occur and have an effective separation, right, yi should not be equal to xi right, for separation. So we have to have yi not equal to xi. So the mole fraction of the vapor has to be different than the mole fraction of the liquid. And we need two phases. Let's say, for example, I throw a liquid into a flash separator. Right, typically, these are operating at some temperature and pressure. <clears throat> I throw a liquid into a flash separator, but I don't form a vapor phase. Well, what happens? All the liquid just goes here, falls down to the bottom of the column, and it just goes out. Nothing happened. 
Let's say I vaporize everything that I send to the system. Well, then all the liquid comes here, gets vaporized, and just goes out of the top. Right? In which case, the composition that I feed to the system either stays the composition that comes out as a liquid, or the same composition coming out as a vapor. So the key thing to operate one of these is that you need two different phases, and that when these two different phases form, the X and Y compositions are not equal to one another. Right? That's the key critical point here. So if you remember the de degrees of freedom that we talked about in the Gibbs phase rule, it was two plus the number of components minus the number of phases. Components and phases. So in the case of a AB mixture, we have two plus two components minus two phases. That gives us two degrees of freedom for an AB mixture. So we need to fix two things about this flash separator. Now typically the two things we're going to fix are the temperature and the pressure. Right? This is the most basic form of a straightforward flash calculation. This is what we're going to be starting with. But in the future, we can work backwards. Right? I could tell you what the composition of this top stream is, and then you could figure out at what temperature and pressure it has to be at to be true. Right? Degrees of freedom work out exactly the same. I gave you two pieces of information. The general one we're going to talk about right now is having temperature and pressure held constant. And this is where we get into our TXY and PXY diagrams. So first, we're going to talk about what a TXY and PXY diagram is. Hopefully, all of you have watched the video. It'll go a lot more smoothly because there is a lot of information contained within these. <clears throat> so let's start off with the TXY diagram. Right? This process right here, this flash separator process, we can solve all of it using a TXY and a PXY diagram. Uh, question here first. Yeah, so you said your, your feed is, is a component A and a component B. Yes. So, so if it's a two-component system, right, you would have an N dot A feed and an N dot B feed. You would have that. So then you're separating that into a gas and a liquid then? Correct. Right, so we need to have the composition of the liquid be different than the composition of the gas, otherwise we're not actually doing a separation. So, so your top and bottom of them would be of A and B. Is there ever mm -hmm. a situation where you'd have all of A turned into a gas? Or Thermodynamically, theoretically, no, that's not possible. You always have to have a little bit of everything dissolved in everything. Okay. So these perfect separations that we've been dealing with in a flash separator, those are not physical. It's not possible to do that. You always have to have some difference. Uh, C, yeah. C is two because there's A and B mixture. Is that why, like, component, like? Yeah, there's two. There's two unique molecular species. So that would be in an AB mixture. There, this, this C would be two, and we have two phases, a liquid and a vapor phase. Okay. All right. <clears throat> so, let's look at a TXY diagram. So I'm going to draw this a little bit more exaggerated. Um, the TXY is a bit easier to start off with, um, so we'll start off with that one. Uh, I'm going to draw it out here. So in your chart, this one is for a uh, isopropanol and propanol mixture. I'm just going to call it Z of A <clears throat> on the y-axis. You have the temperature. In this case, on your chart, it is uh, in degrees C. And we have two curves. One is a straight line, and one is a dashed line. OK. So down here on the left end, we have 0. Here on the right hand, we have 1. So in this case, A is equal to the more volatile component. Now, this is just a convention. Now, the reason why we say that A is the more volatile component is just to make sure that all TXY diagrams look a little bit similar. Right? But that's a totally arbitrary decision. So if you look at this, on the very bottom, it has the boiling point of isopropyl alcohol and the boiling point of propanol. Which of those two is lower? Isopropanol. Isopropanol. Is it more volatile? Right? The more volatile the species is, the easier it is to evaporate it. So if we look at our TXY diagram, our A component, which in this case is the isopropyl alcohol, has a lower boiling point. So this TXY diagram, the pressure is equal to constant. 
And I think in the diagram that you have, I just have it set to one atmosphere. Yes, question. So when it says Z isopropanol, is that Z being our total mole fraction? Yes, it is the total mole fraction. If you either condensed it all to a liquid or you boiled it all to a vapor. That is the mole fraction of everything put together in a jar where you didn't care about the two phases. Z is everything in the mixture. But there would also be species B in there. Yes, so in a two component mixture, one minus composition of species A is species B. Okay. okay. So when we look at our chart, we have it lined up right. Over here, this is the temperature, the boiling temperature of species A. Over here, this is the boiling temperature of species B. It's higher, right? It's harder to boil species B. That's why it's all the way up here. And if you look at our y-axis, if we have Z of A is equal to 1, right? The mole fraction of species A equal to 1 means it's 100% species A. So the unique thing about multi-component systems is that the boiling point and the condensation point are the same. There is only one area where fluid A boils and condenses, and that's the boiling point, just like water, right? So let's say I turn on a pot of water and heat it up and it starts to boil, okay? Let's say I crank up the stove super hot. What is the temperature of that boiling water? 100 degrees. Let's say I turn it down to a simmer. What's the temperature of that water? 100 degrees. Right? Let's say I take the air, take steam and I condense it and it condenses down to, to liquid water. What temperature is it at? 100 degrees. Right? It's always the same point for a pure system. In a multi-component system, it splits. The temperature that it boils at and the temperature that it condenses at are different. And those are called the bubble curves and the dew curves. So the top one here is bubble. This is the bubble curve, and this one here is the dew curve. Oops, sorry, I got it screwed up. Backwards. So what I like to do whenever I look at a TXY or a PXY diagram is I like to take a second and think to myself. Let's say I have a 50-50 mixture of isopropyl alcohol and one propanol. And I heat it up to an extremely high temperature. What phase am I in? Yes. Gas. So I take my 50-50 mixture, I go to a very high temperature, and I know I'm in the gas or the vapor phase. Let's say I cool it down like an ice water bath. What phase am I in? Liquid. So in order to read these charts, we have to recognize that we are going to be following paths of straight lines. Okay? This chart is drawn at a constant pressure. According to our degrees of freedom and our simple flash calculator example, if I want to solve for the composition of my liquid and for the composition of my vapor, I need to fix the temperature and pressure to be constant. Okay? Everyone follow that. If the temperature and pressure are fixed, I know the phases and composition of all of them. This whole chart is at a constant pressure. How do I make it a constant temperature on a graph? What does a constant temperature look like on this graph? Horizontal. It is a horizontal line. I have now fixed my pressure and my temperature. The last thing that I'm missing is my total system feed composition. How do I draw a constant composition on this chart? It is a straight vertical line. So now what we have is we have a total composition a constant temperature, and a constant pressure. Those all intersect right here. 
Did you just pick a random temperature for yourself? I just chose random temperature, yeah. Okay. But for example, in your isopropyl alcohol example, right, let's say I have a 50-50 mixture looking at your sheet. What are the ranges of temperatures in a 50-50 mixture where I am in the two-phase region? So take a second, look at your TXY diagram. What do you think? Yeah, about right. Yeah, somewhere between, uh, you guys said 89 and 91 or so. And you're taking it from the bubble curve to the dew, to the dew curve, correct? Yes, so, so, so if I take a 50-50 mixture and I heat it up, eventually I'm going to start to boil it and I'll get a bubble to form. And if I continue heating it up, eventually the last liquid will disappear and it'll be all vapor. Or I could go backwards. I'll take a pure vapor and I'll condense it. And at some point, a liquid droplet will form. I'll get more and more liquid. And eventually, I'll have no bubbles left and it'll be all liquid. OK, so this intersection of my temperature and composition, this is the point that I'm at. If I overshoot it and I operate my flash separator here, I'm all vapor. And I'm not going to get a good separation. So now the next key part is, how do I know what my liquid and vapor composition is? The dash lines. It is these two points. Right, and when we, when we actually solve for the, TX, uh, the, the dew curve and the bubble curve, it'll make more sense why this is true. But for now, let me just annotate this. This is the two phase region in, in between the dew curve and the bubble curve. Okay, this point right here where your temperature intersects your bubble curve. This gives you your X composition, X of species I. This is your liquid mole fraction. This tells us your liquid composition of, a. of species, oh sorry, of I, uh, of A, yes, on the chart. And so if this is a two component system, one minus this is obviously the species B. This point right here, this would give us Y of A. So now let's take a second and think about this. Do we expect the vapor composition of A to be higher than the liquid composition of A? Why or why not? Does this make sense? Did we do this right? Yeah. Are you expecting the Y to be higher? Why would we expect Y to be higher? That's the question. Bingo, it's the more volatile species, right? By our convention, A is the one that is easiest to boil. So we would expect that when we have a two-phase mixture, that most of the A or more of the A will go to the vapor phase with respect to X as the liquid. Does that make sense? So these are the double checks and consistency checks that I always like to go through when I look at a new chart. I think. Let's say I heat the thing up really high. It should be all vapor. I cool it down really low. It should be liquid. OK, so the in-between region has to be the two-phase region. And then I think, oh, does it make sense that I have an enrichment of the volatile species in the vapor phase, yes or no? Now, so this is, this is a now, now I'm going to switch over to the PXY diagram. And we're going to talk about that again, cover how it's similar. Um, but then also go into a little more detail about what we can learn from that chart. I have a quick question. Yes. The TXY diagram, why is it that the dew curve would be above the bubble curve? Uh, the dew curve is where you get that first liquid droplet to form. So you can think about it like morning dew on grass, right? you have water vapor that's fully dispersed in the atmosphere. But as the temperature cools down, some of that will condense down to dew on grass. Mm -hmm. and so that the dew point is that first liquid droplet that forms. And the bubble curve is the, when the first molecules of whatever start to Vapor form, form, yes. Yeah. So when you start to very first see bubbles form, and that's your bubble curve. OK, so your PXY diagram. Uh, is very similar. So P on one axis, T is constant. I'll write Z of A here. And let me see, okay. So 
Before I even draw anything, let's just take a moment. This is Z, the total composition of species A. Down here it's 0, up here it's 1. Z, so A is the more volatile of the two species. Okay. So you can see on here, you can see the answer, right? It's a line that goes up and to the right. But let's say we didn't know if it should go up and to the right or down and to the right. If I have 100% component A compared to 100% component B, at what pressure does a pure species boil at? How do we know that things boil? So you can boil something by increasing the temperature and by lowering the pressure. When does a fluid boil? What is the property that matters the most? Vapor pressure. Vapor pressure. So which species, A or B, will have a higher vapor pressure? B. It's actually A. A has the higher vapor pressure than B does. Right? Which means that A will stay as a vapor, or sorry, A will condense into a liquid at a higher pressure. So you need, let's see if I can get this right. If a species has a low vapor pressure, it doesn't really want to boil. If a species has a high vapor pressure, it very easily boils. So carbon dioxide has a really high vapor pressure. And the fact that atmospheric pressure doesn't have a vapor pressure because it goes it sublimates, right? But if you choose a different, like, like ethanol, for example. Pure ethanol wants to boil at a lower temperature or a higher pressure, right? They're an inverse relationship. So we draw a line connecting here and another line connecting there. At high pressure, which phase are we in? Liquid. At low pressure, which phase are we in? We're in the vapor phase. So if I take a liquid and I lower the pressure, A will boil first. Then I have to continue lowering the pressure for B to boil. So this point right here is P star, or the vapor pressure of species A, at the temperature that this chart was drawn at. This one here is the vapor pressure of species B at the temperature that the chart was drawn at. So I'm going to have to uh, shut down now. On uh, I'll cover one or two more things here. but. Uh, I will tell you on Friday how we actually make these curves because you'll need it for the homework. So the homework I'll push it back to be doing on Saturday. Um, but uh, so we'll, we'll talk about how we actually generate these curves because uh, we're a bit out of time. Uh, but the one thing, I, last thing I wanted to talk about on these charts here is it's the same idea. Okay? If I fix a constant pressure and a constant temperature, I'm drawing a horizontal line which corresponds to a constant pressure and a vertical line which corresponds to my feed composition. But I can still read off exactly the same information. So if I draw my constant pressure line, my constant composition line, this is where I fall. And I have two intersections where I cross the dew curve and the bubble curve. What, so let's go to this one here. What do I learn? First of all, let's label the dew and bubble curve. Which is which? What is this one here? It's the bubble. How do we know it's the bubble? Well, not the dashed line. A lot of phase diagrams won't have the dashed and solid lines. Right, it's the point where we go from a liquid to the two-phase region. That's the key aspect. This curve then has to be the dew curve. So what does this point tell us about our two-phase mixture? Well, when we're below the dew curve, we're all vapor. But what, what does this tell me about the liquid composition or the vapor composition? Vapor. The dew curve gives us our vapor composition. 
the bubble curve gives us our liquid composition. But the x, y, p, x, y, and t, x, y are opposite, mm -hmm. right? Because t and p have an inverse relationship. You can also see that in the ideal gas law as well, right? So now the last thing that we'll talk about, and we'll have to finish up on it on Friday. This point right here, this is called the dew point. And this point up here, which I kind of smashed up, so this is the bubble point. Right, this is the first point where you have that two-phase region forming. So when you're at the dew point, you can draw a line over here, and this is the dew pressure for this composition of a fluid. So you'd be over there. So let's say, for example, I were to take a 50-50 mixture and I were to pressurize it. I'm going from all vapor until I form my very first liquid droplet all the way to the point where I've pressurized it so much that I'm all liquid. You can see that the ranges of liquid composition and vapor composition change as I go throughout that process. Okay. So if I'm here at this pressure, I have this x and y composition. If I'm at this pressure, I have this x and y composition. Where you are in relationship to the distance between the bubble curve and the dew curve tells you how much vapor and how much liquid you have. Right? I think of it like a tug of war. So when I hit the dew point, my system is almost 100% vapor. So my little anchor point right here is basically on the dew point. And I'm really, really far away from the bubble curve. That basically means I'm almost 100% vapor. If I'm at this point right here, I'm kind of in between. But as I go up to this point over here, I'm getting closer and closer to the bubble curve. As I go up here, I'm closer and closer to the bubble curve. And then here, I'm on the bubble curve. So this is what the lever rule represents. Now, uh, yeah, question. And that just tells you like what you have more of. Exactly. So this is your flash calculation that tells you how much of NB and how much of NT you have. Yes? At what point do you want the separator to be at? Do you want it to be right in the middle? Or, or it all depends. Right? So if you, want the most in, if you want the biggest difference in composition between your gas and liquid phase, you either want to be at the dew point or the bubble point. But the problem is, if you're at the dew point, you're forming an infinitesimally small amount of liquid. If you're at the bubble point, you're forming an infinitesimally small amount of liquid. So it's a balance. The more of the two phases you form, the closer together their compositions get. Right? So I think of this like a tug of war. So in this circumstance here, right, I know I have more liquid than I do gas. Because I think of it like two teams tugging against one another. Whichever has more moles of that fluid, they're pulling it that direction. Up here, you have even more liquid than you do bubble, than you do vapor, and even so here, right? Whichever team has more moles on, moles on its side pulls the center point closer to either the bubble curve or closer to the dew curve, and that's the lever rule in a, in a sort of conceptual manner. Can you apply it to the, to the TXY? Yep, exactly the same concept with the TXY. Yeah, question back there. I think I might have like a quick example. So, like, you know, when they ultra pasteurize it, mm -hmm. they pump it full of superheated steam to mm -hmm. raise the temperature, and then they put it in a flat separator. Mm -hmm. uh, so you want just a tiny bit of the milk to boil off because you just want pure milk in the end. Mm -hmm. Where would that be kind of on the, if you want it to be 100% milk as your, no, you'd want it to be 0% water. You will, you'd want to recover as much milk as possible, but I'm sure they lose some. They have to lose some yeah. when they ultra pasteurize it. Yeah, you have to lose a little bit. But I mean, milk, the, the stuff you care about in milk, right, is the proteins and all that kind of stuff. And so those are going to have a very, very low vapor pressure. So in that case, a flash drum might actually operate very well. Because like, uh, like rocks, for example, have virtually no vapor pressure. And so you have very limited losses of what's going on. But if you have any other non-water-based liquids, then you run the risk of, of losing the amount of the stream. But for example, if you were trying to dry out a salt, yeah, you're not going to lose any salt out of the vapor stream because the vapor pressure is extremely low. Going back to our Routes law, that P star, if that's very, very low, then you'll never get any stuff coming out of the vapor phase. Okay, so I've run over my time a little bit, so I'm going to hand it over 
Uh, well, so let me, let me wrap up the video first, um, and then, then I can continue on. 